Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming uh, to the talk about uh, giving and receiving feedback. I want to first say I'm not an expert on this by any means, but it's an area of interest, an area of growth for me. And uh, I would hope that this would actually be maybe a little bit more of a discussion rather than a lecture, because I think uh, you, all have, you all have experiences that could be really uh, useful. So why would I be interested in this topic? I'm not a feedback guru at all. Well, first of all, feedback is ubiquitous. We've all been getting feedback since we were kids. Back in school, you know, you get all these quizzes and tests and report cards. We have standardized tests. We've probably all done a whole bunch of standardized tests. We all get our work performance reviews. I got four different bosses. They all review me every year. And uh, even Andy Smith, the CEO, the board reviews him every year. So this, these constant uh, performance reviews. And then uh, medical training is actually uh, evolving. So it, I don't know how much it's going to really evolve, but it used to be that, say, residency for our specialty, physical medicine rehab, you put in your five years, passed all your, um, your uh, courses, all your uh, rotations, uh, and then you were done. And now it's evolving to more of a competency-based medical education. That's what CBME is. So it says, no, it's not just the years, but it's you have to attain certain competencies. And to get there, it's based on feedback and coaching so that the uh, interactions between the trainer and the learner are not so much, okay, you passed. It's more like, all right, if you want to get better, if you want to get to that next level of mastery, this is what you have to do differently. So it's that coaching and feedback that we're evolving to. And then personal relationships. I don't know, maybe there's someone here who hasn't received feedback from a loved one or a partner, uh, but if uh, that's the case, you probably don't speak to very many people, I don't know. Uh, most people get uh, feedback. But these tend to be some of the more difficult conversations. So let's just talk about what are some of the benefits of handling feedback well. Um, any thoughts? What are the good parts of handling that feedback process well? Rosalie, you look like you have. Yeah. Leads to change in behavior. Leads to change in behavior and growth. Yeah. Does it make you happier, you think, or make your work better? It may. So uh, just a few, a few thoughts here. So handling feedback well doesn't mean always just taking the feedback wholesale and say, oh, great idea, I'm going to do all those things. It means listening and having a conversation engaging on conversation around feedback so that you understand what the giver of the feedback uh, uh, is saying and seeking out a further understanding of feedback. But in the studies looking at feedback, generally a, a, a satisfactory, a successful feedback process leads to a higher job satisfaction. People are happier at work when they are able to get and give feedback successfully. More creativity. So if you're able to take feedback and change what you're doing, you're more creative. And ultimately, more adaptability. And this gets into a little bit of how we view ourselves. Do we view ourselves as a, a sort of a fixed entity, that this is the way we are, and that's the way it is? Or do we fix, view ourselves as moldable? Also, you get better organizational performance. So if we you know, have a really robust feedback process where we can talk to each other about how we might do things differently, that's a better organization than if no one's afraid, you know, everyone's afraid to say anything because you're afraid to uh, hurt someone's feelings or you just don't feel safe. Anyone here with John Gottman, the relationship expert? Probably the psychiatrists have. No? Oh, he's a, a big uh, relationship expert in the US and he's done um, studies uh, of married people and he uh, quantifies the performance. I actually know him personally because our daughters went to school together. But he's been on Oprah. He's written a bunch of books. And uh, he looked at what predicts a successful marriage. And it's really the ability to accept influence uh, and listen. Uh, and that's associated with a healthy, stable marriage. When you don't accept feedback, you don't accept influence, that's a bad sign. And the marriage may not last. So what are the thoughts? If you're going to work on something, if we ourselves were all going to work on something, is it better to work on giving feedback or receiving feedback? 
Any thoughts? So some people are saying you have to work on how to give feedback. Yeah, well, I'll talk. To <laughs> yeah, we do have to do we have to do both. But if you're going to work on something, receiving and I'll talk about the the why this is receiving is the key. Because you can give the best feedback in the world. You can give me the most insightful thing about my lecture, but if I'm not in the mood to listen to it, it's not going anywhere. So, uh, and also that's what we can change as receivers of feedback. That's what's under our control uh, to change. And it has the biggest effect. How we receive feedback has a really big uh, effect. And so um, this book, is uh, sort of a, a key book, it, at least it was for me. It's called Thanks for the Feedback. And the real book doesn't have the sticky note on it that says, even when it's off base, unfair, poorly delivered, and frankly, you're not in the mood. That doesn't come with a book. You have to add that on separately. But um, it talks about the science and art of receiving feedback well. And these are really, these are two very well-known authors, well-published. They taught, they wrote the um, Harvard Negotiation Project yeah, they're from the Harvard Negotiation Project. They wrote the book, Having Difficult Conversations. So this is a very influential book. And if you're interested in more, just want to read one thing, this is kind of a quick read and uh, expands a lot more on everything that, that I would be saying here. So just the receiving versus the giving feedback. Why is the receiving more important? The receiving is the pull, where we ask uh, to understand feedback to us better. The push is giving out the feedback, giving our free advice to others. The pushing feedback is only so effective no matter how artfully you give it. You can have the best scripted message of feedback to someone, but if the other person's not interested, it is really going nowhere. And you can keep on pushing and think about revising the script, but it's just going nowhere unless the recipient is ready to hear it. And I don't know, uh, uh, we're all different ages and we've been through different experiences, but I've been through different ways of giving feedback. So one was the sandwich to say, so uh, Nancy might say, oh, you're dressed really well today. So she gave me a good comment. Your tie is off by a little bit, but your shoes look great. So I might be the guy who says, all right, well, Nancy said I'm a really good dresser and just go home from that and just hear all the good stuff and not the bad stuff. Or I may be the guy who just focuses on that one little negative thing, even though there were 10 good things. And so the sandwich isn't really all that uh, effective. And that used to be the, the um, educational model too, was around students was the sandwich, good, bad, good, or good, constructive, good. And then the later part was ask, tell, ask. Hey, can I give you some feedback on what we just worked on today? Then they would say yes. And, well, this is what I noticed. And then they would apparently hear that. Then you would ask, well, you know, what are you going to do from this point forward? That's a bit better than the sandwich. I'm sorry. And then the, probably the, the latest evolution is a conversation. We'll talk more about this later. Uh, a real conversation back and forth so that both people understand what we're talking about. So just again, like I said before, if a receiver isn't ready uh, or willing to absorb, then pushing harder really doesn't help. So that idea of creating an interest in all of us to understand feedback from any source, to be anyone, uh, is essential for us. I don't know if anyone has a hard time getting constructive feedback. Maybe, maybe no one does. But why, why is it sometimes hard to receive feedback? Any ideas or any thoughts? Sorry? I couldn't hear. Pride, pride, yes, pride. That it hurts your pride. Any other thoughts? Criticism. Criticism, yes, criticism. Remind you of your mother. <laughs> <laughs> That's our psychiatrist talking. Yes, it takes us back to our birth experience and reminds us of the difficulty we had. Uh, at, at the core, uh, it seems that we really want to be accepted as we are. 
whatever we are, we want to be accepted like that. And when we hear feedback that we ought to change, that says, well, maybe you're not okay as you are. You might want to change something. And so in a way, it threatens our identity. And this, again, gets to how our identity is um, fabricated and how we think of it. So there are sort of three triggers that block us from getting feedback and using it successfully. One is the truth. That is, you might hear something and you say, I don't think he or she knows what they're talking about. I don't think that's true. There's a relationship. Who is he to tell me about how to give a lecture? Like, uh, you know, you, you might have a relationship with someone that prevents you from, from uh, giving, getting the feedback. Or the identity, what we just talked about, that it threatens your identity to hear they should be doing something differently. And while all of these might be reasonable, the problem is that if you just get stopped at one of, one of those, if you say, well, they don't really know, or they don't understand, or I'm not going to take feedback from them, then you don't start that productive conversation. And the conversation to understand more is where you make, uh, make progress. So let's just talk about the truth triggers. Truth about whether the information is, or doubt about whether the information is true. And I'll tell you what I'm looking at right now, for instance, is our uh, picker patient satisfaction scores. They're not where we want them to be. And we'll, we'll talk about this probably at a future point. They're not where we really want them to be. And so I've been through this in multiple institutions. You know what the first reaction is when we bring this to a group? It's not, let's get better. It's, the data's wrong. I know patients who love us, this data's wrong. Or the comparison group is wrong, or the sample size is small or the methodology or the analysis we're on. We always can find some little flaw in the feedback that might lead us to say, I'm not looking at that data because the sample size is too small. It has to be 10,000. I only got 300 here. So be aware of those truth triggers uh, that you can always find some flaw in the feedback. Uh, and, but also be aware that we all have uh, blind spots, things that we may not know about where even if the, the information is only 50% true, the other 50% might be helpful to us and elucidate a blind spot. Sometimes the truth, we can find a, a flaw with the feedback because it's just too general. So if Nancy says, you're being too American. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know what that means. Is it my pronunciation is off? Is I'm too pushy? Is it say not enough negative stuff about Trump, I don't know what that means. So how do I know if that's helpful? I have to ask, so I'd have to say, well, tell me more. What does it mean that I'm being too American? Tell me what I did or what you're noticing. That's probably the key thing if you were to take home anything from today is once you start to receive feedback, it's not to shut down and say, no, that's not relevant. Just find out more, find out more what, what's meant. And then there's also a potential problem with realizing what kind of feedback we're getting. Can anyone think of, are there different categories of feedback? <coughs> so that's constructive feedback. And that would be sort of coaching, where you've got someone, you're saying, you know, you're doing well, and this is how you handle your students. But next time, I want you to do it a little different way. So coaching is probably the most common one that, that we work on. But there's a couple of others, too. What about the end of the year performance review? Is that coaching? No, that's evaluation. So that's a different type of feedback, where you know where you are in the organization. And there's a third type, which we all like to get a lot of, which is appreciation. So appreciation is a different form of feedback. So appreciation is, hey, thanks, great job. Nice job on this, uh, this thing that you worked on. <coughs> Coaching is, you know, you're doing well, but I want you to get to the next level. And this is some feedback that you could use to get to the next level. Evaluation is where you got a, a grade of B plus this year. That's just the facts. You, that's your score on your exam. 
and there's no sort of coaching that goes along with that. Coaching could um, come afterwards. So can you think, sometimes we want one and not the other. Can you think of times of when we'd want appreciation? Well, every day, I mean, appreciation is good to get. Uh, how about coaching? When would you want coaching? Yes, if you're doing something new or outside of your comfort zone, if you're a learner instead of a trainer, even if you're a trainer, a teacher, you'd want some coaching how to be a better teacher. And then evaluation. Are there times you actually want evaluation? Yeah, sometimes every year you want to know, well, how do you stand within the organization? How do you stand with your family? You want to have an evaluation. So if you're expecting one thing or seeking one thing and you're getting something different, it doesn't work. So if you're expecting an evaluation at the end of the year and your boss says, hey, good job, see you later next year, that's not, that's not satisfactory. Even though it's a nice that they said, oh, good job, it's not what you wanted. Uh, and if, if you're seeking coaching, but you're perceiving that you're getting an evaluation instead, that's not very satisfactory. So it often helps to clarify what kind of feedback we're giving and getting so they're on the same page. Now, just to get back to appreciation, appreciation is really uh, important. It's associated with a high level of job satisfaction, but there's a few things to be aware of when you're giving appreciation that make it more uh, useful or more acceptable. It should be specific. So if I say, Nancy, good job today, she doesn't know what I'm talking about. If I say, you know what, you set this go-to meeting up so well and you got all the slides up and then that's, you know, much more specific and she, she knows what I'm talking about. And public versus private. She may prefer private, but I just did it public. So, but you have to be. <laughs> and some people want a title, some people want other forms of recognition, but just be aware of what the recipient wants. And it has to be authentic. So don't just do it as a checking a box. We had... Um, in the U.S., and Matt, you probably had this too, the Studer Group come and talk about how to do patient satisfaction, how to improve patient satisfaction, how to improve service. So one of their things was you got to write thank you notes to all your employees every month or so. And even the, the guy in charge of security and parking, he had to write a thank you note to all his folks. And it never came across as really authentic. It was a forced thing. And so I don't think it was all that successful, but it has to really be authentic. Coaching is what we do most of the time, especially with students and, and learners. It's a little complicated because the person being coached really wants to learn how to get better, but they're always a little sensitive about evaluation. So, you know, uh, next time when you put the needle in the patient, make sure you pick the right side, not the wrong side. So they're perceiving an evaluation in there I'm trying to coach them to not get confused on the side, but they're perceiving an evaluation. Well, does Robinson think I'm a bad, you know, I'm stupid or I'm bad at uh, keeping track of the sides? So try to reduce the evaluation and the coaching. And, the, and sometimes it helps to clarify to the recipient, hey, today I'm just going to coach you about how to do a better job. We're not going to do evaluation. Um, exactly. So we'll be explicit about the type of feedback we're having and try to separate out coaching from evaluation. So um, when you get the two together, it's a little bit challenging, but when you separate them out, it's better. So if I were to you know, help someone with a poster uh, and say, you gotta change the font. Well, they're trying to think, are they, does Robinson think I don't know how to do the font, don't know how to do PowerPoint? So it's better to say, you know, I think you're an eight out of 10 on doing posters, it's great. But to get to a 10 out of 10, then the coaching, this is what you would need to do. So do the evaluation first, get that out of the way, label it as such, and then go to the coaching. It's, it's, then the people are ready for the coaching. So evaluation should generally come first. Relationship triggers are the second type of trigger after truth trigger. So this is concern about the person giving the feedback. But remember that no matter who gives you the feedback, even if you don't trust them, you can't stand them, there may still be merit to it. And the challenge is to disentangle the issues 
from the relationship. And this is where we would call upon Matt and Rosalie to help us disentangle if we needed to. Disentangle the issues from the relationship. And often this comes up as a sort of a sidetracking. Yes, uh, uh, I know I kicked the cat last night, but you kicked the dog off too. So then it becomes a, sec a secondary issue. And the way to try to handle that is to say, okay, well, we can cover the dogs too, but let's cover the cats first, one, one pet at a time. And um, part of the relationship issue is what different people see. So, where's my pointer? There it is. So if this is the person doing the behavior, this is the person on the recipient of the behavior, the person behaving, they know sort of their thoughts and feelings, maybe. They know their intentions. Oh, my intention is to help this person get better. But they don't really see their behavior all that well. They don't really see the impacts on others around them. And they don't know what story the others around them have about the first person. The only way to know what your behavior is like or your impact on others is this feedback process. You have a gap in your, in your this dotted line is your field of vision. You know your own intentions. My intention is to help this person get better. But you don't really see your behavior. You don't see your facial expression, your tone of voice, and you don't know what the impact is on the other person. So the guy to the right is thinking, man, this, this person's a jerk. He's, he's just criticizing me. He's being very aggressive. But the person on the left is saying, I was just trying to help the other person. So these are common blind spots. And just remember, our emotions often aren't visible to ourselves. And this is a couple of quotes from the book that I found helpful. When something goes wrong and I'm part of it, I attribute my actions to the situation. But you attribute my actions to my character. So there's that attribution error is a problem. And then impact versus intent. We judge ourselves by our impact. So I was just trying to help the guy get better at doing his EMGs, but they have what they're aware of that I'm not is the impact that I have on them. So that feedback process is a way to help the person on the left understand not only their intentions, but their behavior and their impact, and perhaps they want to change it. So feedback helps us to see these blind spots uh, we can't see them by ourselves. You know, we can't really see uh, our own faces, hear our own tone of voice. And um, we, to, to get a better idea of the blind spots, we have to get, we all got supportive friends. And especially Canadians, you guys are just so nice all the time. You won't give negative feedback very easily. Uh, in the States, it's a little bit more in your face, I think. But when you're getting feedback around something, um, you want honest feedback. Uh, probably an example that, uh, that I have that I think about sometimes is I was in a, a course at the Rotman School a couple of years ago. We had a group of six and we just gave each other feedback. And one of the women who's from Russia said, do you think my accent, she had a pretty strong Russian accent, do you think my accent gets in the way of me doing my job or getting promoted? And the other people in the group said, oh, no, no, we understand you, we love you. But I said, you know, actually it might, it might, because she was looking for honest feedback. She wasn't looking for support. She had this group of people she were interacting with. She wants honest feedback. And so uh, I think if you're looking for honest feedback, ask for that. And if you're being asked, you really want to give it in a sensitive, but um, honest way. Has anyone videoed themselves or recorded themselves? I hate this. I hate looking at my own recording. I remember uh, I looked at Amanda and Matt giving grand rounds. I said, you guys are wonderful, but I don't think either of you like looking at yourselves, and I hate it myself. Yes, you can look at your doctor's talk. Yeah, you can look at your own doctor's talk if you really want to suffer. <laughs> you can also get around the blind spots by asking people around you, is there anything I'm doing that's getting in my own way? Is there some... And again, we wouldn't be aware of it. Is there anything that's getting in our way? And then lastly is the identity triggers. That is, things that threaten our identity. Um, sometimes we inflate our feedback too much. So we'll get a little piece of feedback, and we'll expand that in our own minds so it's about 
It's how someone just hates us and, or we're, we're, we're useless or valueless. You really want to take a reality check. This is where probably the cognitive behavioral therapy comes into play. What is really being said? What is really being intended? Uh, uh, so we sometimes do inflate our feedbacks too much. And sometimes I think we'll get feedback that we don't know. Is it evaluation or coaching? It's not really clear. We're better off if we can sort it towards the coaching side. If we can say to ourselves, well, they were just trying to tell me how to do my job better, or how to be better in the relationship. Sort towards coaching whenever you can. If you sort towards evaluation, saying, oh, yeah, they were just telling me they, they don't like me. That's not going to get you very far. And usually it is intended as coaching. So sort toward coaching uh, when you can. And also we're affected by how we review ourselves. So not necessarily as fixed. Or if we are, if we view ourselves as fixed, and this, you know what, this is the way I am. Love it or leave it. That's just the way it is. That's hard uh, when we get uh, criticism or get uh, feedback. But if you view yourself as a growth person, where, you know, I'm, I'm kind of moldable. Yeah, if I get feedback that I got to pronounce things more Canadian way, I think I can learn that. I can pronounce musculoskeletal and cervical and all those weird pronunciations. <laughs> I can add the U's. So, okay, that's okay. I'm moldable few things to consider as you are uh, going through the feedback process. So in the terms of identity, it often helps to embrace nuance, that you're not just totally fixed uh, and set in stone, that there are uh, nuances to your character. Accept that you'll make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Uh, we have complex intentions. Our intentions are generally quite good. Uh, we Usually if there's a problem, we've all contributed in some way, and we're complicated. And try to shift as we can from sort of a fixed mindset where this is the way I am, I can't change anything, to more of a growth mindset where, hey, feedback might be useful to me because I can modify how I behave or how I think about things. And again, sort towards coaching whenever possible. We've all seen others make mistakes. We've all made mistakes. Uh, in, the polit in politics, you see this in the press all the time, certainly in the States and in Canada, you see people make mistakes. And what defines them is not necessarily the initial mistake, but how they react to it. What do they do in response to the discovery? What do they do when, when they've made a mistake? That's actually many times carries more weight than the initial mistake itself. And, if, and people can be forgiven if they apologize, if they realize, yep, I've made a mistake here. Um, in the same way, it can help to give yourself a second score. Okay, you got some constructive feedback. How did you deal with it? So score yourself for how you handled the initial feedback. That can be a way to help uh, receive feedback more effectively. And lastly, the, the conversation. So this is, again, a shift in, in how we view feedback, where it used to be sort of just the tell person, then it was the sandwich, and then it was the ask, tell, ask. And now I think it's evolving, at least in, in this book that I referred to, it's uh, more of a conversation. So the opening of the conversation is really important. What is the purpose? And this is, again, getting into that appreciation or coaching or evaluation. Clarify that up front. And if you're the receiver, also clarify. Why are you telling me this? Is this to get better? Is this because getting ready to fire me? Is this because you just want to show appreciation? You want to figure all those things out ahead of time. Figure out what's their intention and what do I want out of the conversation? If I'm seeking an evaluation, I'm not going to be happy with appreciation. So it's better to put that up front. That body of the conversation is often best to have that as a two-way exchange of information. So listening, be a really good listener. If some of the facts are, and especially the material facts, if those are wrong, starting where those are not really clearly understood and then the problem solving okay so we've got to change things let's work together on how to problem solve and it often helps to dig for underlying interests so i so that we each know what the other person what the underlying interests are is it you know to build the organization is it to build me personally as a an employee and then the close where we summarize what we discussed clarify what we're each going to do, what the action steps are in the follow-up. 
So this is sort of, uh, I think, probably the state of the art of how the feedback uh, conversation uh, would go. So just a few take home points that I'll offer and then I'll open up to the floor because you all probably have a lot more experience uh, than I do. There are opportunities for us all to work on how we receive feedback. That's something under our control. You know, it's kind of easy to say, oh yeah, he should have given me the feedback in a different way. Then I would have received it better. That's, that's easy for us to, us to think that someone else should have done something differently, but the receiving is the thing that's under our control. We're on the receiving end. Be aware of those triggers that will stop us from receiving the feedback. Questioning, is this really true? Who is this person that's telling me and why? How does that fit in our relationship? And does it threaten our identity? Think about the three types of feedback and clarify what the intent is. So appreciation, you know, I don't think any, if anyone feels like they've been too appreciated at work, raise your hand because I don't think it happens too commonly. So appreciation is, Wendy, you've been overappreciated? No, okay, <laughs> just checking. <laughs> So appreciation is really important, but it's separate from coaching. So clarify when your intent is coaching so that the person you're talking to doesn't think, oh, I want appreciation, but they're getting coaching instead or vice versa. Uh, whenever you hear feedback, you don't know where to place it on those three categories. You're best off putting it in the coaching category because that's usually what the intent is. And that's going to get you the furthest in terms of how you deal with it. Whenever you hear feedback, the best reaction is not to shut it down, not to just say thanks, it's to say, tell me more, help me understand where this is coming from. Because the initial opening, is probably not enough information for you to understand where they're coming from. You have to understand more and have a conversation. Think about a growth identity for yourselves, that you're not fixed and you know set in stone, but we're all moldable. And then if you want to read more, and Talk about it more. This book is really it's a very important, a very useful book to read. Um, so I'm going to stop there, and I'd love to have conversation from from all of you. No feedback from the lecture, but conversations, okay? <laughs> Just here. What are others, Matt? Uh, so one of the things we're, we're noticing with uh, psychiatrists moving towards competency and certification as well, too. So on the previous slide, we were talking about appreciation versus. Evaluation coaching. We actually remove the coaches from the evaluation process entirely, so the coaches don't hmm. have any say on the evaluation or anything inside that. The residents don't work with them on the primary rotations, or all people who are removed from that. And so sort of the feedback we have from residents was again, if the coach was in an evaluator role, they wouldn't be able to give honest sort of dialogue with the coaches on that conversation, mm -hmm. and they felt like they're going to be evaluated. Thinking back to prior time of residency, I don't think if I was being evaluated by a coach, I'd give as honest of dialogue if I found the coach also. So we actually sort of separated them out as two different roles. So the coaches are sort of completely removed from evaluating the residents. So they get all the lower stakes evaluations throughout the year, and they sort of come up with the resident with the learning plan. And I think the other thing the CBB is doing is uh, normalizing feedback. So rather than one evaluation at the end of six months, the residents are getting sort of serial assessments. So they have several low stakes assessments, which are called encounter records, where they get feedback in the dialogue as they have these sort of feedback, mini feedback sessions several times a week. So it sort of takes out the lower stakes, takes out the high feeling and high stakes from feedback. Because right now when you get feedback for the learners, it's very high stakes. It's your midterm feedback or your final feedback. Yeah. There's not a lot of sort of dialogue. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing we notice at least during the CDB and watching the press is making sure the coaching is separate from all of And Matt, do you think the learners that are coming through are ready for this new model in terms of constant coaching and it really from two perspectives. So one is just have their experiences up to date, prepare them to be good receivers of feedback. But second, and this is where my age comes into it, just the millennials sometimes they're like, you always get a gold star no matter what you did. And so are they ready to be told that there's, a, there's that next level to get to? Yeah, and so I think it's a, a challenge on both sides. So it's both again, the residents are that again, we're changing the language around things. So Classically, when you're on a rotation, everyone gets fours and fives, and if you get a three out of five, which is normally out of other weeks, weeks um, the need for the rotation, that's seen as like, you know, I don't know, three out of five, whereas that's really where everyone should be. So we sort of changed the language around that to be 
in progress. And the idea is, again, everyone's supposed to be in progress out of rotation. A lot of it's faculty development saying, and the new normal is this is where we expect 99% of residents to be. <laughs> Only very rarely should a resident sort of be fully entrusted to do an activity. The CBB language is moving towards, again, if you leave sort of uh, for the day, do you feel uh, that you can sort of entrust the resident learner with doing activity A or B? And the PRC. So part of that's orientation up front for the residents, and a lot of it's sort of orientation for the faculty who are used to sort of giving fours and fives, and again, mm -hmm. they run into trouble with whatever they can yep. forget the five instead of, again, the challenge in medicine is we don't fail, uh, fail people, uh, or again, we have a failure to fail, it's sort of um, it's part of the culture, unfortunately. Yeah. So hopefully that Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question if, you, if, if you're giving a class, class of feedback, uh, do those small ones contribute to the Yeah, so right now, for example, for our residents, they'll have... Or, or does it come as a big surprise? Hey, I've got really good feedback constantly. Yeah, so the residents have access to their feedback, so when they encounter a first time on lunch final day, it sort of goes to sort of a system where they can see the feedback, and they get those constant sort of feedbacks from their clinical encounters. They also have exams and other things that sort of go into that. So it's sort of like a dashboard where you can see everything. It goes into a final evaluation. Uh, and then the idea is again not feeling a rotation, but just making sure that you practice your interview skills. You need more time to do skill A, B, or C sort of on your rotations rather than you fail the rotation. So you need to sort of work together to make sure you get that experience. Question here. One more comment just to echo kind of what Matt was saying about normalizing the feedback. Like when I my teaching program, I went to McMaster, which is problem based learning, and it's groups, and it's everything is in a group, and everything is feedback, feedback, feedback. And so, all I say is, like, at, by the end of it, you have to be able to, to give it, as we do even with our clients and some of that, but and then also receive it. And I would just say to you, like, it's true, like, it's it's the top goal. What are you, you going to do? Like, you have no choice. But it's true, but it's, but it's the more you do it, the more it happens. It does become a very normalized thing, mm -hmm. and you also you also become much more skilled at receiving and giving it and all that stuff. So, it, and then the idea is if you're giving this constant feedback for a number of any way, but then it, then there shouldn't be a surprise at your term or you know whatever it is. Like so, you can kind of tweak it all. So, it's just that if you if there's an effort made, I think that it does become much more normalized. It's not so threatening. Mm -hmm. Question here or comment here, and then, then the other. Yeah. Okay, so I agree with Michelle. I think when I take on a student, I'll ask them also, how would you like to be connected daily, weekly, mm -hmm. so that I know what works for them, not to work for me. And I think even if you can find them at the end of the day and reviewing, what mm -hmm. listening to things you did well, what we can give you opportunity to move on. That by the time midterm does come, there shouldn't be a surprise. And can we see if learning is effectively taken by me giving some coaching along? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. In my last job, I was the vice dean for postgraduate medical education, and we would survey all our 1,200 residents across all the programs. Probably the most consistent thing we heard was, "I didn't get enough feedback." No one said I got too much feedback. I didn't get one comment like that. It was always, "I didn't get enough." So our learners are, are yearning for more, more feedback, not not less. Peter, and then yeah, you know, first. Just along the line, your question was if we we have an idea if there's sort of like an optimal frequency for each of like appreciation, coaching, and evaluation. Because I feel like too much or too little can end up being overwhelming or underwhelming. So where where is there a sweet spot for each of those areas where you're going to get the most out of it? Yeah, that I don't know that there's an answer to that. I I think th this is just my opinion on glad for others to speak up. So appreciation, usually, especially while well, at work and home, usually we underappreciate. So more is likely better. But it has to be authentic. It has to be specific. Um, but more is likely better. I don't think you can do too much very easily. Coaching, it depends on the situation. So when I'm training the residents, I'm constantly coaching. I'm trying to think of something every patient encounter hey, this is what you could have done differently, or I want you to think about it differently. So it's that constant, and I don't think there's too much of that. The evaluation, I think it has to be more rare. 
So, you know, maybe it's an annual workplace evaluation, end of resident evaluation, and mid, mid sorry, mid, end of rotation and mid rotation evaluations. Those are useful so people know where they stand. Uh, but I don't think that should be as frequent as the coaching appreciation. I don't know what others feel. Yeah. Uh, the university, I think, is trying to get around the I do a lot of self evaluations or they want the students as well. They want us to take one role, ask them to, well, how did it go today? How do you feel about today? So they self evaluate, so you kind of get down, get down on them. Yeah. But also, then the conversation, and so when you evaluate and they self evaluate, you kind of at least reduce conversations around where you both agree, both seem like they're on the same page. And the conversation happens on areas where sometimes it's too, too critical. And you're like, no, actually, that was a check. Um, and where sometimes they're other critical. And I'm like, well, actually, many give examples and it helps uh, well. Yep. But I, I, I wonder about the students, because even a situation with someone uh, from abroad who is coming to, um, to I forget what it's called, but it's a kind of a residency program where you're already fully trained, but you just want to sort of make sure that you're within the Canadian standards. This yeah. is when I was a student in Quebec. And I thought the feedback initially was brutal. It's like, you know what? But I felt nervous. I thought, wow, but this, this let me explain the situation. The person was basically going to pay because there's too much of a gap. And that was within the first few weeks. There was too much of a gap that they would that, um, the instructor knew that within a few weeks they just wasn't gonna, they weren't going to be able to be at the point where they were going to be able to get their license. And when the, the, the therapist said, hey, you know what, we could just end it now, or um, we could use these weeks, I'm free, and if you want to take a lot of feedback, try to get the most you can out of the six weeks. No, I would be surprised if you pass it, but let's do a checklist and see what you can achieve, and then maybe with your next placement, you'll be that that much ahead. Mm -hmm. And so it was, and I thought, wow. And then it did, that person did end up staying. Mm -hmm. But I thought, gee, that's pretty brutal feedback. Like, but it is honest. Um, and uh, and at least that person got what they could have in six yes. weeks, and it was sort of, you know, and they were thankful. And they were probably in the right mindset or frame of mind to accept the constructive feedback. And that's a, because they wanted to pass. Yeah. Um, so. They, they, they wanted the opportunity to eventually get their license. They just listed that at that particular person's day. It was honest. And it was helpful because that person could eventually apply for it. You got a couple of tries where you can, and at least they were six weeks of training. Yeah, yeah, and that's probably where the evaluation part helped too. So they knew they were not going to pass. The evaluation uh, was one right from the start, and, yeah. then, and then there was steps. Um, and, and in the other case, in the other case with the self evaluation, is we're going to pass. But where, okay, how do you go? And where do you feel? You know, what what kind of support? Can you help? Um, so it's your, it's really clear that you're there yep. to feedback that, that you know that you're there to support. Yep. And there's less of an evaluation, less of a conversation. Yeah. Okay, I see it's one o'clock. Thank you everyone.